Okay. Good evening, everybody. Thank you, Dawn. Take it from the top. Good evening, everybody. Uh, thank you for joining us for our second session of this leadership training series. My name is Eric Cuello. I am the Director of Community Affairs here at Manhattan Borough President's Office. Um, really appreciate you guys signing up and being here to kick us off on our first day. Uh, we had a really great conversation on open data earlier this afternoon. So just want to thank those of us who, um, or those of you who were on here earlier. So looking at you, Kevin and Janice, um, really appreciate it. Um, I also want to make a quick plug for the other five sessions that we have this week and encourage anyone who has the ability to attend them. Um, one in particular that um, I'm really excited about is a brand new session on understanding housing finance, which I would um, encourage everyone to take. Um, we'll also have one of our sessions in person at our office on One Center Street. That's going to be on emergency preparedness in conjunction with the New York City Emergency Management Office and the American Red Cross um, and limited availability, but we'll have some emergency preparedness kits or bags to take with you too. So hopefully we'll see you there. Um, before we get started, I just want to thank the borough president for uh, Mark Levine for uh, supporting this initiative that we really do enjoy setting up every year. Um, I also want to thank Keisha Sutton James, um, who is our deputy borough president and handles a lot of organizing uh, this and working with our unit overall. And um, I also want to thank Porfirio Figueroa, who um, really does a lot of the work of connecting with everyone beforehand, making sure that we're set up to go. Um, we could not do this session without him and with Dawn, who manages, and I'm sure all of you already know Dawn or have an email from Dawn, so this doesn't happen without Dawn either, so thank you. Um, I know Porfirio is going to kick us off and introduce us to our uh, presenter, but I just wanted to quickly say thank you for those who are here for our mandatory conflict of interest training. Um, Porfirio, as I said, will handle the introduction, but I will just uh, make a note that if you haven't had a training with Alex, uh, prepare to be amazed. Um, we we love having uh, Alex uh, present. He's done it uh, every year for us, and we still have folks uh, tell us how much they enjoy it. So uh, with that, I will pass it to Porfirio to do introductions. Oh, thank you so much, Eric and Alexander Kipp. It is wonderful to have you here. Um, my name is Porfirio Figueroa, and I am the community coordinator for the Manhattan Bowes President's Office, and I'm also liaison to CB 11 and 12. And uh, full disclosure, this is actually the bio that Kip sent me, okay? So Alexander Kip is the Director of Education and Engagement at the New York City Conflict of Interest Board, where he leads a team that teaches classes, creates videos, prints social media and learning content, and conducts lots and lots of webinars for New York City's over 325,000 public servants. He says his work has been described by at least one elected official as impeccably deranged, which Alex hopes is supposed to be a compliment, compliment, which we translate as he truly brings humor to a really difficult uh, subject. And so uh, it is with great honor that I pass it over to Alex Kipp. Okay, friends, let me, uh, thank you so much, uh, uh, Profiro, for that introduction. Thanks, Eric and Don and everybody else for setting this up. Friends, I'm going to jump right into slides. We're going to talk about everything community board related in the New York City conflict of interest law. Um, Eric, just give me a thumbs up. Can you see that slide show there? Yeah? Okay, great. All right, here we go, friends. We'll go right from the beginning. Um, so if you've had this training with me before, this is going to be some of the same content. I've added in a couple of other concepts because I think that they they help us in understanding what the boundaries of the law are. There's one especially interesting concept that might be the explicit examination. This will be a little bit new, and it's what counts as an associate under the New York City Conflict of Interest Law. And this is a really important question because I can't take an action as a public official if the result of that action, like voting on that action, uh, would uh, 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 turn into a benefit to me 
uh, or this associated party, right? So uh, um, if it's an associate that we're talking about that might benefit directly from your vote, you can't, that's going to be where you have to disclose, discuss, don't vote. So it's, it's important to understand like what falls inside of that and naturally then what falls outside of that. Um, there's a hard boundary there, and uh, and we'll spend a couple of sides really getting into the nitty gritty of that. And we'll also review some concepts. So, uh, like like we do every year, friends, we're going to go over the core functions of the board just a tiny bit, so you get the context, you know what we're about, you know how to use us. Uh, put any questions that you have in the chat. I'll answer as many as we can as I can when we get to the end of the slides. Don't wait, don't wait. Put it into the chat as soon as you get it, because otherwise you'll forget. I'll answer as many as I can. We'll keep this thing to a tight hour, though. People got other things to do, so we're going to end at six, but I think we can get through all the slides and answer a few questions. So we'll do a little bit on the basis and purpose after the core functions, because that's going to inform, I think, the, 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 how the law has been interpreted and, indeed, what are the, the fundamental de definitions that it works with. Uh, and we'll do some, some uh, greatest hits about c community boards and conflict of interest. So I'll be what is covered, and we'll answer questions at the end. So here we go. Okay. The, the, the conflict of interest law, if you don't know, is a, it came out of a big process of charter reform. There was a real appetite for charter reform in the mid 80s in New York City government like there hadn't been for a while. Now, part of that was maybe driven out of the scandals of the third Koch administration, the Queensborough president's office, former Greek Queensborough president Donald Manis. Part of it was some constitutional questions about how this body, the board of estimate, which no longer exists, uh, uh, was so important to the workings of city government. But charter revision took a deep dive, 86 to 88. And one of the smaller things that they did actually was they rewrote the city's ethics law into this conflict of interest law. Its goal is very modest. It is to help well-meaning public servants like you and me who have happened to give part of their lives over to you know, the public interest in navigating those relatively rare instances most of the time where something from their private life is overlapping with their public duties. Uh, and and that's uh, this is not an anti-corruption law. This is really about like, hey, we've got great people. They happen to be very resourceful and interesting in their private lives. Naturally, conflict of interest questions are going to come up for those kinds of people or any kind of people in government service. This is the place. This is the body of law where people figure out how to deal with those conflicts. And because it's a body of law, there's got to be a conflict of interest board to tell you exactly in plain language what the law means. Okay, so um, it's conflicts between public duties and private interests. And this is taken right from the preamble. The law's intention is to preserve and promote public integrity by helping public service address conflicts between public duties and private interests before those conflicts become ethics violations, ethics problems, ethics questions. So everybody on this call is going to get a conflict of interest law question at some point. Probably if you're a community board member, it's going to involve voting in some way. When do you have to uh, – uh, uh, when do you have to uh, – what are you precluded? What are you prohibited from voting? And what do you do? And how does that work? Um uh, uh, and we're here to answer those questions. So um, uh, when we, let's see, okay. Uh, and these are the kinds of questions that are gonna come up a lot. Is gonna be your uh, outside financial interests or the financial interests of those with whom you are associated. So that question of voting can come up when it's a question of your property, your business, or then uh, uh, the business interests of anyone with whom you are associated, and we're going to jump into what that means in just a second. So just a word or two about what the College of Interest Board does before we get into the very big details here is we've got three units basically to think about. We've got a training unit. I'm the director of that unit. We make a lot of stuff, as was referred to in the introduction. Some of it's very straightforward. Some of it's playfully deranged. Dan Garotic was the guy who said that. It's not a surprise, but he's the one who said we were playfully deranged. So I take that as a compliment from the clever uh, uh, Dan Garotic. Um, we used to have a Twitter feed. It was so great. But you know what? Twitter's owned by a guy who we didn't want to associate with anymore. So we're not doing that anymore. Then we were doing these great TikToks. People love the TikToks. And then somebody else said, you can't do TikTok government anymore. Like, okay, what's left? YouTube, I guess. Oh, and also we're on Blue Sky. It's not as not as many fireballs, but I do suggest you follow us on Blue Sky. Get into it. It's actually like what Twitter might have looked like 10 or 15 years ago. Very calm, actually. Um, that's what we're trying now. And we're tr I think we'll have a new video drop there probably tomorrow. Anyway, who cares? Uh, what all my stuff is basically to help people like you remember in those rare instances when you've got a conflict of interest question that we exist, hey, and we're human, and we can answer questions quickly, and we do it by getting you in touch with the legal advice unit. When they wrote the law 30 years ago, they said the conflict of interest board's primary function is in 
prevention. That means legal advice is the most crucial thing it's going to do. So legal advice, uh, we've set up to give it to you one-on-one -on -one whenever you want it. You, you call us up you, on this number. You go to our website. You do a little, there's a button that says get free legal advice. You type in your question. Uh, the question goes to our attorney of the day. There's always an attorney on call to answer questions every day. Who, so we're there to answer uh, you talk to you one on one. Everything's confidential. Everything's free. We know what free means. Confidential means that any uh, activity you're proposing to do, we cannot share your request with anybody in the world, not the press, not your spouse, not a fellow community board member, not anybody. So you've got a safe place to for free ask us about like, what are my options here? Do I have a violation or not? Or do I not have a violation? And if you don't have a violation, that can be very valuable too, because we will always give you a copy of what we tell you confidentially in writing. And then once you have it, it's not confidential for you to share, it's just confidential for us to share. So you could say like, hey, I have my thing analyzed. Turns out it's not a violation. There you go, right? Um, turns out I can vote on this thing. That might be valuable to you at some point in your community board service. So just remember in life, as I always say, Remember that advice in life, when should we ask for it? Before I do the thing, because if I ask for advice after I've done something that violates the law, that's not advice. That's a confession. We don't want you to do that, right? An admission of, I already did this thing. Call us before. Um, um, well, we're, our job is not to get you to know. Our job is to see what are the options. Is there a yes? What is the process? And we'll tell you all that stuff and we'll do it quickly. Um, okay, so uh, please don't call us like the day of the vote though, right? We want a little more time than that. We got a lot of people, thousands of calls coming every, in and every year. So we'd like a little bit more, uh, more time than that if we can get it. Okay, so enough of that. There is an enforcement unit. That's the third kind of tip of the, the trident of administrative uh, um, uh, oversight of conflict of interest. So I'm not going to get into too much on enforcement today, but, you know, there are cases. We have them every year, maybe 100, 150 cases a year. Um, cases shake out differently. Uh, 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 an accidental one-time violation could mean a warning letter from the board. Uh, uh, an intentional violation that's very serious could mean a fine, and the fine could go up to $25,000 for one violation. And if there's multiple violations, then the stuff can stack up. So uh, nobody wants that. Um, every once in a while also... Uh, a DA's office will take a case as a criminal matter. It's never happened to a community board member, so probably not an appropriate conversation here, but it, it can happen. But most of the time, the enforcement comes directly from the conflict of interest board uh, itself in the form of administrative, you know, civil penalties through the administrative process. Okay, so I haven't been that many community board cases. We might mention a couple of them today, just as examples of things to look out for, fact patterns, you know. Okay, but before we get to that, we're going to get to this, which is the most important thing that you do on the community board, which is the discussions and the voting. You will notice there are visual cues in this genius design I have put together about discussions got green on it, voting's got red on it. That is intentional. Uh, so the reason why is because Generally speaking, you are never precluded from participating in discussion, even if you have a conflict of interest. Um, so let's see what we've got going on here in the next slide. Okay, so what's important is you can't vote. Conflicts and voting, that's the most important thing. So let's review that right now. And what does it say? It says, voila, okay. Um, you may not vote when you have a conflict of interest. Boom, there you go. All right, I think now it is Miller time. Just kidding, just kidding, because now we have to figure out what a conflict of interest is. Nobody hang up yet. Okay, so what is a conflict? A conflict is when, a situation when, if you voted on the thing, voting on the thing would cause a direct economic gain or mitigation of loss for yourself or for someone associated with you. Now, for yourself, we know what that means. It means the business you own, uh, uh, the property you own, et cetera. But then what is an associate? What is an associate? Oh, boom. Well, all right, sorry, that was my, I messed up my joke. It's like, oh, we're done. But now we got to define associate, actually. That was supposed to be the joke. Here we go. So here's what an associate is. Um, associate, legally speaking, for Chapter 68, is a, a close relative, like a spouse, child, parent, sibling, domestic partner, registered domestic partner, or anyone with whom I have a financial relationship. And we should construe that broadly, right? So my outside employer, my client, if I have a private practice, my business partner, a debtor, a creditor, a landlord, a tenant, a roommate, 
um, my supervisor at my job, a not-for-profit if I sit on its board, even for no money, right? Because you have obligations under state law, fiduciary obligations to the not-for-profit. These are all kinds of, <coughs> excuse me, parties that you, with whom you are associated. And therefore, if there was a question on the vote that the result of voting yay or nay would cause a direct economic benefit or mitigation of loss, you would have to preclude yourself, prevent yourself from voting. It would be prohibited from voting. Okay, now let's look at the converse, right? Or the, the rest of it. Like that's what's in the circle. What's outside of the circle? Well, what's outside of the circle is everything else. So this is actually an example of what's on the list. It just kind of repeats, except I did it in a different bullet point. And, and one, before we get to what's outside of the circle, this is kind of more elaborating what's inside the circle. So business, your property, business partners, clients, employers. Now, one thing to note here, and this was an enforcement case. It, I think it was a warning letter case or a very low fine, and it did happen in Manhattan, so it's worth going over here. You'll notice this very esoteric point down here. Not for Employer is not-for-profit, funders over, of not-for-profit over 10%. What does that mean? Okay, let me give you the facts of the case. It's an old case, but it's worth it's worth talking about here. So there was a community board member, Manhattan, on the west side, I believe, kind of lower, not not super low, not like Stuyvesant, but a little further up on the west side. And um, um, uh, uh, so he was a community board member, and at the same time, he was the paid president of a not-for-profit that did some kind of economic development, waterfront, something. I can't remember now. Not important. What is important is that he knew that he couldn't vote on anything that was directly related to his employer, the not-for-profit. But here's where he got into a little bit of trouble, is that his not-for-profit was basically funded by only two sources. And he's the paid employee of that not-for-profit. So this one entity that funded his not-for-profit, I don't know how many percent, let's say 50%, they had an issue come before the community board. This guy, who's also a community board member, should not have voted on that thing because basically that entity was under underwriting his salary. So the rule that developed out of that, that person received, I think, a warning letter for voting on this thing. He should have precluded himself from voting. And one of the reasons I think why it was a warning letter is because at the time, and this is going back like over 10 years ago, it was like, well, maybe that wasn't so clear. But now it's clear. There's a rule on this. If I'm employed by a not-for-profit and one of the funders funds over, underwrites over 10% of the not-for-profit's operating budget, then I'm, I can't vote on their interest, even though their interest might be separate from the not-for-profit where I work, I cannot vote on their interest because they so directly underwrite my salary at that not-for-profit. And that's what that means. Um, uh, that's a lot of... Um, I don't particularly like explaining that rule because I feel like it's a lot of balls to keep juggling in the air, but that's the sense of it. Uh, and the enforcement case sort of spells out exactly those facts. So I've hewed very specifically to that public enforcement disposition to try to keep it clear. Okay, prospective employer is another one you wanna be careful about. I'll talk about this towards the end. If there's somebody who's in the process of hiring me right now, I don't mean like they said one time a year ago, like, hey, maybe you should work for me. But like we're in the middle of negotiations. I'm also not going to be able to vote on something <coughs> that uh, impacts that, that employer. OK, now what's not OK? What's an associate we already talked about? What's not an associate uh, here? Everything else. Right. So look at these relatives, cousin, uncle, aunt. And then we've got these other things, friend friend, whatever that is, you know, like Facebook friend, whatever. Your Facebook friend is probably a bot at this point, actually. Dude, you knew. These are not associated with you. And I know that sounds crazy because you might say like, well, friend, I mean, I got friends who are close to me, closer to me than I am to my own brother, right? But it's just not done. So let's articulate the hypothetical here. Let's say you've got an old buddy. You're not financially associated with that old buddy. They've got a matter coming before the community board. Uh, uh, just because you love this guy, um, uh, or, uh, you used to hang out or you used to be re roommates in college 20 years ago. If you've got no current financial entanglement, you are not associated with that old buddy. And there's no reason that you have to refrain from voting because friend is not 
defined in the conflict of interest law. And the reason why is I think because it's too difficult, right? And uh, here's the example, right? Do you ever have that person who kicks around your cubicle or your office, if you're that lucky? Uh, they're always visiting you because they were sure you were friends and you weren't that sure. That's what we're talking about here. Friends, how many of us have them, right? So um, um, uh, that was a dated rep reference for people of a certain age like me. Okay, now, um, um, uh, so all these people are not people that you got to worry about. Disclose, discuss, don't vote because unless you're in a financial relationship with uh, one of those entities. Okay, now we the other. So we've just spent a lot of term saying one of the thresholds that's got to be met where you can't vote is it's got to be an associate, right? So your employer, your client, your brother, your uh, father, et cetera, right? Okay. The other term of art that's got to be defined here is direct. You can't vote when there's going to be a direct benefit or mitigation of loss to that thing that's either yours or with whom you are associated. And so this is very important in understanding when you've got to disclose, discuss, don't vote because you've got a conflict of interest. So I'm going to do the example. I may have done this example before. It's just such a clear one. I always pick it. So here's the example. You know, I've got dreams. I didn't always want to be a director of training and education of the mighty conflict of interest board. Someday I might actually follow my dream and I'll own the tiki bar. Uh, and um, uh, but I'm a little bit of a misanthrope. So maybe only take out tiki bar, kind of reduce the contact there. It's like where everybody knows your name from far away. Just take the drinks and go. In any case. Now, let's say not only do I own a tiki bar, but I'm also on a community board. Man, high roller, this guy. Uh, my tiki bar is where? I don't know. Let's say East Village. That seems like a good place to open a tiki bar. Maybe. Maybe. I, I haven't been there in a long time, but used to go there a lot. So tiki bar, East Village, on the community board. Can I vote on my own liquor license application? No, I can't. Why? Because those two thresholds have been met. It's direct and it's to me. It's my bar. So therefore, when the liquor license app comes for its re-up to the community board, uh, which is going to make a re recommendation to the SLA, I'm the guy who goes, hey, I didn't disclosing, that's my bar, right? Um, uh, and then I'm going to, I'm free to discuss, right? Hey, it's a great bar, no problem with this bar. It's like, it's right by that, uh, you know, Asher Levy School downtown village where, like, think of all the things we're doing for the children. That's a joke. But in any case, I, I, I can say whatever I want. Like, hey, I think you should read my liquor license application. This is a great bar. I can say whatever. Um, uh, and then I do not vote. That's a third D because it is my own liquor license application we're talking about. But let's say, for example, there is some other conniving individual who is now seeing how successful I am and they want to open a tiki bar next to mine. Maybe on the First Avenue, Second Avenue, maybe on one of the side streets there. I don't know. But in any case, um, uh, um, uh, the question is like, whoa, uh, that might have an impact on my business. But is it, is the voting on the liquor license app, is that directly affecting anything right now of my financial interest? No, it is not because I do not own my competitor's bar. And we quite frankly do not know if having a competitor next to me is actually gonna drive up traffic and I get me more revenue or less revenue. It's too amorphous, it's too putative, it's too non-direct for to, to uh, uh, precipitate uh, uh, disclose, discuss, don't vote. I know that feels weird, but it, direct is so important here in trying to understand where I am precluded from voting. And when it's a competitor's liquor license application, I don't own that bar. It's simply not close enough. And therefore we are good to go and you don't need to use disclose, discuss, don't vote. Now, I've just I've been saying this, right? Like, hey, that's my bar. Then I'm free to discuss. And then I do not vote because it's my bar. Now let's do another example here. Uh, okay. This is not for profit. So let's say I sit on the board of MoMA, Uptown, different community board. I just, my, uh, I don't know how I made that move. But in any case, uh, I'm sitting on the board of MoMA for design expertise, obviously. So I sit on the board and now the local community board says, hey, we want to discuss something directly related. Hey, we want to, to cultural affairs to give more money to MoMA for something, for example, right? Uh, I'm going to do the same thing. Hey, I sit on the board of MoMA. Then I'm free to discuss. Yes, you should do this. No, you shouldn't do this. And then I do not vote on the thing because it is a um, I am directly associated with MoMA and the
the, the funding request is directly going to the that MoMA where I sit on the board, and therefore I've got a uh, I can't vote on the thing. Okay, now uh, I want to talk about one thing that's related to not for profits that we didn't hit, and it's and but it's related to this idea of associated. In order for me to be associated with a not for profit. Either I have to be employed by them in some way, like their employee or their attorney or their grant writer, something like that, or maybe for no pay, I sit on their board, right? There's a third way that people kind of like are affiliated with not-for-profits, but it doesn't rise to the level of association. And that could be a dues-paying member of a not-for-profit. So let's take everybody's favorite or most hated, depending on who you are, a not-for-profit transportation alternatives, right? Um, just because I pay the dues to be a TA member does not rise to the level of association where now I have to use the three Ds every time we talk about uh, something um, uh, related to transportation alternatives. And it actually, there's actually two reasons, right? There's two reasons why I wouldn't have to ever use the three Ds. The first reason is because when, so transportation alternatives in general loves bike lanes, right? But if you vote yes on bike lanes, it's not like transportation alternatives all of a sudden has more dough in their pockets, right? So even though they love bike lanes to happen, it's not a direct financial benefit. So even if I was sitting on the board of transportation alternatives, which would make me associated with them, if all we're talking about is a new bike lane, I don't have to disclose discuss on vote because there's no direct impact, benefit, or mitigation of loss back to TA. It's just a thing they like, right? It's not a direct financial thing. Now, let's say I'm not on the board of TA, and now we are talking about a funding thing that's going to go directly to TA, but I'm just the dues-paying member. I did it once, or I did it every year because I wanted to do the fiber rope bike tour, whatever. I did it once. It was pretty cool. Uh, um, now, um, I was, oh, man, I was really hungry afterwards. Though. And in any case, um, uh, uh, just because I pay the dues does not make me a board member. So now the question is, the funding request, we want something to fund, go from, I don't know, DOT directly to transportation alternatives. We're going to vote on it. I do not have to use disclose, discuss, don't vote, because I'm not sufficiently entangled with TA just by paying the dues in order to, to uh, cross that threshold where we say I am associated with transportation alternatives, right? So, okay, now I wanna move to something very different, but it's actually, the, the, the outcome is gonna be exactly the same. You gotta use disclose, discuss, don't vote, even though it's like not about private interests and it has to do with the public interest. So those of you who have government positions or quasi government pos positions, this is for you, listen up. Uh, this is what it means. I am going to have a conflict where I'm not allowed to vote if there's some sort of re request that comes from the community board and goes back to the agency that employs me. So the classic example is uh, we want a speed bump and I work for DOT. Uh, I'm not going to be able to uh, vote on the issue where we say, hey, DOT, we need a speed bump because the people are doing crazy stuff, blah, blah, blah. Um, uh, uh, why? Because I work for DOT already. I can disclose. I can discuss. I do not vote. Now, you might be on the what, what's up with that? Why? Well, here's the thing. DOT employs me 40, 50, 60 hours a week. That's my, I'm a primarily I'm an employee of DOT. And the vote of the community board is supposed to be free from any sort of even appearance that there was outside influence. And I think arguably, who cares what I think, but this is what the law thinks, is that when the DOT person votes on the DOT request, it can feel like the vote's been tainted by the person who's employed 50 or 40 hours a week by the agency, right? And there's not supposed to be any taint of that. And therefore this city employee cannot vote on something when the request is gonna go back to their agency. So same thing with DOE. You're a, you're, you sit on the community board, you're a DOE teacher. I don't care where you're a DOE teacher. You could be a DOE teacher in Forest Hills. Bad commute for you, probably. But you can't vote on anything related to DOE because you are a DOE employee. Okay. 
Now, it's not just city agencies, but you see like it's New York State, it's federal government, and then it's quasi-governmental agencies like the post office, like the UN, like any public university, whether it's SUNY or CUNY or the University of Kansas, all of them, <laughs> same thing. I don't think NYC does any business with the University of Kansas. So nothing to worry about there. But this is the exhaustive list. Public authorities are in there too. So if you think about like the MTA, for example, uh, charter schools are on here, local development corporations, the Brooklyn Public Library, Queens Public Library, they're all on the list, right? So if you're an employee of one of these kinds of entities, you're going to use the disclose, discuss, don't vote if the request is about something going back to that entity with which you are employed. Okay, now time check. Doing good. Here we go. All right. Um, same thing. Disclose. Hey, that's my agency. Free to discuss. Do not vote. And then the other thing, and this is always true, whether you're a government employee or whether you're a private employee, remember that you're always a community board member at the community board meeting. So if DOT needs somebody from DOT to make a, rep a presentation about why we can't do the speed bump or here's our speed bump and what a great speed bump, whatever, they can't have you do it. Because at those meetings, you are the community board member. You're not the DOT employee. And that's also true for, you know, um, uh, um, for example, if I'm uh, uh, an architect, right, and I've got clients that need like, need a zoning variance before my community board, I can't say like, hey, guys, you know what? Let me take off my community board hat. I'll be right back. And then I could come back in with my architect hat and go say like, hey, I'm representing my client. No, 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 no. Uh, that cannot happen, right? That client is either going to have to get somebody else to represent them. And if they want to stick with your firm, let's say you're a partner at some architecture firm or a law firm or engineering firm, any kind of firm, right? Um, you can have your partner do it, but you need a waiver from COIB. So I'm not going to get into the basic, the, the, the details of that, but it's just to say um, you can't represent clients before the community board and neither can your firm, if you own a firm, um, uh, unless you get a waiver from us and it's going to set up a, a wall between any actions taken by the firm and anything you do at the community board, for example. Okay, now use the three Ds, disclose, discuss, don't vote. I've said that so many times. Let's move on to other things. Chairing. Let's talk about chairing on committees just for a second. Oh, no, chairing the, let's talk about chairing the board. Look, um, uh, chairs can have conflicts like every, anybody else. They're going to follow the three Ds, disclose, discuss, don't vote like anybody else. But here's the thing. If I, the chair, if there's like, if agenda item five is the one I know where I've got to use the disclose, discuss, don't vote, then guess what? I am not the chair for that entire meeting, not just for the issue, but for the entire meeting. Uh, somebody else has got to be the chair. I don't know if, how your bylaws are. Do you have a deputy chair or a vice chair or whatever, but it can't be the chair who's got the conflict. It's got to be somebody else who chairs the entire meeting. Now let's talk about committees for a second. Committee chairs. Committee chairs are going to do the same thing. Disclose, discuss, do not vote. You also are going to not be able to chair that committee meeting for the entire meeting, not just that individual issue. And now here's the thing. This is actually not that new. It was, I mean, probably 10 years old at this point, but just so we're aware, the, the, there was a slight tweaking of the rules about 10 years ago where it used to say, if you sit on a committee where you break, or if you chair a committee, where you've regularly got to use the three Ds, disclose, discuss, don't vote, then you can't be chair of that committee, which makes sense because, you know, like you can't be chair anyway, right? If, you know, if every time one of your clients comes before the, the, the committee, like you can't be chair of that entire meeting anyway, that makes a lot of sense. But then the board was like, well, what does regularly mean? So they did us a favor, I think all of us, and they, and they defined it. And it means three times or more within a calendar year or a 12 month period, sorry, 12 month period. So let's say like, again, with the architecture example, I've got a client, they come in, they, they're they making a presentation for whatever they need, zoning variants or whatever, before the committee that I chair, I got to use the three Ds. And if that happens within with three times within a 12 month period, then guess what? I can't be the chair anymore. Uh, I can always serve on the committee, but I can't be the chair. Now, remember our DOT example. Uh, you cannot be the chair of a committee that regularly interfaces with your government or your similar entity. So while you could be on the transportation committee and be a DOT employee, you probably can't be the chair of that committee. Same thing with like, if you've got a, whatever you call it, youth services committee or education committee, those committees are probably 
thinking a lot about DOE related stuff and a lot of requests going about DOE or from DOE or to DOE, whatever. So if you were a DOE teacher or DOE administrator, DOE, whatever, you could definitely sit on the committee. And that might be really great because they probably need your expertise, but you can't chair the committee because it's so much of that substantive work is probably related to your city agency and you couldn't be the chair anyway uh, for the, any meeting where that was true. Okay, now let's see what we got here. Okay, vote tabulation. I've been doing this for a while, so I hope this is just review for everybody. Conflicts do not affect your quorum, right? So quorum is 50% plus one. Let's say 26 people show up to the community board meeting as they always do, I'm sure. Hallelujah, we are doing some business tonight. Now, in order to pass anything, we need a majority. We need 50% plus one yes votes in the room to pass the issue, right? So there's gotta be more yeses than your combinations of no's and abstentions to pass an issue. So let's look at this just for a second here. Here's an example. So in a quorum meeting of 26, a matter is up for discussion vote, and there turns out that three community board members have conflicts of interest issues for various reasons. We don't have to go into the details. Now, normally, if you had 26 eligible votes, you would need 14 yes votes to pass the issue because 14 is more than the combination of no's and abstentions, which could only be 12 in that instance. You got 50% plus one. That's what 14 is. And 26, boom. Now, here's the thing. While quorum is maintained, if these three people have conflicts of interest, remember, they're not qualified to vote. So the number of eligible votes actually just dropped in the room. It's not 26 anymore. It's 23. So now the number of yes votes that you need to pass in this room just went down from 14 to 12. And that's the difference. That's what conflicts affects. It's not the... Um, quorum, because these people are still in the room and they're participating in the discussions ostensibly, um, but it's going to change how many yes votes you need to pass the issue. And so I think that's what these slides review here, right? So the conflict of members do their thing. They disclose their respective conflicts. When do we disclose? We disclose before we discuss. Don't be sneaky. Like, don't disclose after the vote's been taken. Ha ha, right? It's a little too late. It's also not very nice, but it's also a violation. Like, if you want to participate in the discussion, you got to do it. You got to disclose first. So these three conflicted members, they then participate in discussion because they've disclosed. Uh, the three members do not vote. Quorum's maintained at 26 since all participated. Uh, but <clears throat> um, now we've only got 12 yes votes needed to pass the issue because these only, because the vote count is changed because those three people are ineligible to vote. I would not call them recusing. Recusing, I'm sorry, abstaining, abstaining. Abstaining is only something you can do if you are qualified to vote. If you are qualified to vote, you can vote yes, you can vote no, you can abstain. Abstains and no's are counted together versus the yeses. But if you have a conflict of interest, you are not qualified to vote, so you're not allowed to abstain. You are listed as ineligible to vote due to conflict of interest, and because of that, there's less eligible votes in the room. Okay, so as a semantic project, I would suggest that uh, that however you're recording the individual who is not qualified to vote because of conflict of interest, which they've disclosed, I would not call it abstention. I'd call it something else. Okay. So uh, and that, that just here, right? So if you're eligible to vote, yes, no, or abstain. If you're ineligible, you can't vote yes, you can't vote no, you can't abstain, uh, you can't do any of those things. Okay, other topics real quickly. Let's do one that I just wrote an article on, I'm sure you all read it, and it's about the do you know who I am problem. Yeah. Friends, let me just say this, that I think that while I understand why People may be tempted to do this, as I have been from time to time. Uh, um, it, the, 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 the resolution that we expect that we will get in our heads when we think about using this phrase is often not the one we were hoping for. So maybe leave it as an in-your-head voice sort of uh, option and not out loud. Um, anytime we invoke our city position to get something for free, uh, to get out of a ticket, to get a, um, a, a special dispensation only for us, we've probably violated the law. Uh, and that would include invocation of city position in order to threaten someone, et cetera, et cetera. This is taken from one of our award-winning films. The rotoscoping over here took forever, just so you know. All right, so 
Um, business cards, email addresses uh, for the committee board are only for committee board purposes. Keep them that way. They're only for, for committee board purposes. And then, you know, like I said, we don't use our city position to get special treatment, to get VIP treatment. Now, um, uh, um, uh, uh, we're going to go into a little bit about sort of common class discounts where nobody cares who you are. Can you still participate in those? Of course you can. It's when people want to hook you up because of who you are, or if I, as a city employee, say, you better hook me up, or can't you hook me up because of who I am, we should stay away from those kinds of, of fact patterns. Okay, so let, and this is a related conversation, gifts. So I could teach a three-hour continuing legal ed class about all the laws that are implicated when you think about different kinds of gifts, fact patterns. I won't do that to you. I'm going to give it to you like right here, which is that basically what you need to be concerned about is gifts that are offered to you by dint of your city service. As a community board member, they should be graciously refused. So let's look at two different fact patterns that are involved this community board member one. On the left hand, you'll see that Juan is a longtime patron of Dino's, a bar in his neighborhood, or the Dino's. I don't know why he's called that, but some idiot wrote this hypo and didn't spell check. Um, occasionally, the bartender buys Juan a round. So now that Juan is a community board member, can he continue to get a free round at Dino's or the Dino's? Yes. And you know why? Because I don't know if you've ever been in a bar, but when a bartender gets you a free round, they're not doing it because you're special. Right. Sorry to disabuse you of that idea. Right. That is a that is a business strategy for higher tips and maybe sitting around longer or bringing in more friends. This is a place that gives you a drink every once in a while. So that's the thing they do for anybody. That's the common class notion. Right. They're not doing it because of who you are. They're doing it because uh, uh, that's who they are. Right. Nice turn of phrase there. Juan, on the right-hand side here, receives an invitation for a free dinner at the North Star, a new eatery in the, eatery in the neighborhood seeking a liquor license uh, that's going to need approval through his community board. That That's the place where Juan's got to graciously say, no, I can't accept free stuff from you guys. You've got the license app before the community board. I cannot accept that. Now, relevant enforcement case. A number of years ago, there was an individual who um, essentially... Uh, there was a club called the Soho Club, I believe, a club apparently featured in Sex and the City, a show I've never seen. Uh, but that club, which is Soho House, maybe it's called, whatever, doesn't matter, somewhere in the meatpacking district, I think. Um, and uh, a community board member was wined and dined there and then offered a membership, I think, for him and his spouse for a couple of years. And that was a, an enforcement case because essentially... He was offered that stuff because of who he was on the community board, not as like some Joe Blow off the street. And that ended up being a, a case where the his enforcement fine was the value of the stuff, the membership over how many ever many years that was, plus then a, a, a fine for the behavior on top of it. So it wasn't small. It might have been 8,000, 10,000, something like that. Anyway, fairly significant fine. Um, okay, so... Uh, as I mentioned before, friends, representing private clients before the community board is a no-no. You can't wear two hats. So if you're an architect, a lawyer, an accountant, an engineer, or whatever, uh, when your client comes before the community board on any matter, you've got to use the three Ds, even if it's something you don't work on for them. But then if it is something you work on for them, you can't be the representative. It's got to be somebody else. And if you own the firm... It can only be you know, somebody else at your firm if you get a waiver from the conflict of interest board. Now, those waivers might be granted. They might be granted, but you've got to ask, and then the waiver is going to be in writing if the board gives you that dispensation. Uh, and the board was probably, I'm not the board, but I'm thinking that the board probably will give the dispensation if there really does feel like the, a credible structure can be built, a wall can be built such that there is no uh, feeling of overlap or influence uh, having you sit on the community board and having your firm represent the client. I think that probably happens uh, uh, frequently, with some frequency. Now, uh, uh, so here, Sally's a CB member, she's also part of a law firm, or, or firm wishes to represent the client on the zoning matter before Sally's CB. Don't get caught up on the fact that like, oh, well, Sally was just handling their will. It's different. It doesn't matter, right? It does not matter. If her firm or she's a partner wants to represent the, the client on anything, the waiver is going to be needed from the conflict of interest board. Okay. So she gets the waiver, she uses the 3D, she doesn't represent the client, we're good to go. Now, uh, 
financial relationship with community board staff, board members, you can't have one. You can't loan community board staff money. You can't hire them. You can't be their lawyer. You can't be their real estate agent. You can't be. You also can't politically solicit the community board staff. Why is this? Why are these two things here? Because what the rule says is you can't have a financial relationship between a superior and a subordinate. You as the community board member are thought to be the superiors of the community board staff. So you can't even ask them to do anything in terms of a campaign. And you also can't get into a financial relationship with a uh, community board staff, district manager, or anybody else. Close relatives of community board members may not serve as CB staff. That's also a rule. Uh, um, again, that's because uh, you have some power over the appointments there. Uh, and there would be a creation, at least the appearance of impropriety, if not some something worse. So that's a rule. Uh, now, uh, what's next? Okay. Every once in a while, and I think this was maybe more popular during the Corey Johnson years, but there was this time when community boards were getting a little bit of dough, where not where they just were asking like, hey, HPD, throw these people some money, or hey, DCLA, throw these people some money, hey, DYCD, whatever, but they had some of their own money to give to recipients, like not-for-profits within the district. Um so then the question comes up is like, well, we've got a need. We've got somebody sitting on our board. They're like the executive director of not-for-profit who does the exact thing that we need them to do. The, the least, the, 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 the crow's path to getting this done is uh, 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 essentially hiring this person to do it because they're, they seem to be like the best for the job and we don't have to look for anybody else. Can't do it. Can't do it. The only way that a community board member is going to be able to do business directly with the community board that they sit on is if they get a waiver from the COIB. And the standard here is going to be considerably high. The standard that has to be met is no other entity in the community board district can really fulfill this need. Like, And that's a high bar. I think that's a high bar. And why is it a high bar? This is New York, man. You know, like I, I'm from Manhattan, Kansas, Manhattan, Kansas. And when I was growing up, I think there was only one grocery store. It's called the Dutch Maid. Uh, um, uh, Manhattan, Kansas, small is where K-State is. My parents were professors there. In any case, it might be like you're the community board. You're also own Dutch Maid. Maybe they got to buy groceries from the Dutch Maid because where else are you going to go? But that's simply not true in New York City. So I'm not saying that this is never going to happen, but it's it, the, the bar is exceedingly high because, again, this is kind of the singular notion that you're the only entity that can provide the services. Uh, and so I don't think it's met with any frequency. Um, so waivers are, um, it's pretty easy to, to apply for a waiver. You go on our website, there's a button at the top now that says contact. There's a button on the list that says get a waiver. You fill out your thing. Legal advice gets the request electronically. And then we follow up with questions if we've got them. Waivers happen with a lot of frequency. Um, the conflict of interest board, it was always thought in, in the notes of the Charter Revision Commission, sort of like our Federalist Papers, that, uh, that waivers were going to happen on a fairly regular basis. Many of the waivers are not for community board members, they're for like sort of outside employment for full-time city employees, but it's just the waiver process is quite well established over 30 years. And so we'll be able to tell you very quickly whether or not this waiver is a go, right? Is this something the board would entertain or not, uh, given the facts? Um, okay, last couple things uh, very quickly, which is good because I'm running out of time. Okay, leaving city service. Well, like I said at the beginning, you can't discuss possible future employment with the firm you're currently dealing with on your job. So the hypothetical would be this. Veronica is a professor of architecture. She's a CB member on the zoning committee. Columbia Universities, they've uh, got a matter before the community, uh, the zoning committee. Veronica is applying for a tenure track position at Columbia School of Architecture. So if it's true that Veronica is in the application process, which might take a long time, uh, um, she cannot also vote on Columbia's matters. She's either going to have to suspend the application process, which she's probably not going to want to do, or she's just going to have to use the 3D, say disclose, discuss, don't vote. Why? Because she's in the middle of being considered for a job at Columbia University. Um, okay. Also, once you leave your CB, you can come back to a meeting the next day and talk about your opinions as a member of the community, but you can't make a paid representation of another entity before the community board for one year. So let's say there's some entity out there, they need somebody to make a presentation on their behalf because of their zoning, blah, blah, blah. You can't be their paid representative back before the community board for one year. Okay, this happens sometimes. You see this as an enforcement case. It's this fact pattern. Finance director of audits, lease city service to work for a private tax consultancy, of course, because that's what you would do. 
But with this particular person, he contacts the Department of Finance eight years on behalf of private clients within that first year, and the result was a $5,000 fine. So that's a typical kind of post-employment one-year ban case right there. Okay, now done with the deck. We've got a couple of minutes for questions. The 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 go ahead here is you're not going to think about us till you need us. That's fine. That's true for everybody in city government. When you do think about us, we're easy to get a hold of. You if you're nostalgic for the telephone, use that number right there. We're open for business nine to five Monday through Friday. You you could even write us a letter. If you're weird. You are a weird person if you do that. But you could do that, and then we'll you know we'll probably um, write back to you. Um, uh, or maybe you give us your email address in there, or just log onto our homepage and there's a button that says get advice. It's on the left-hand side and we can answer your question that way. But, uh, and, and just like I said, we wanna answer the question as early as we need to, to get you the fulsome answer with all of the options, tell you what to stay away from. That's easier done when you're not calling us like the day of the book, right? Okay, so now that I've gone through all of that, maybe we'll, uh, I don't know if one of my friends at the, I'm Manhattan here. Borough President's Office wants to like um, uh, just read us the questions, if there's any questions that we can answer. Yep, I'm happy to do that. First of all, thank you, Alex, for the presentation so far. Uh, we'll try to do this as lightning round as we can. Yeah. So I'll read out some questions. Uh, first question we have was, if we have a nonprofit uh, community service, so a 501c3, um, and don't get paid for our work, um, can we announce the projects at full board meetings while serving as a board member, or would that be a conflict of interest? That's a great question. So I think the way to think about this is um, um, there are um, there are ways for interested um, sort of actors in the community, like not-for-profits who have events and block parties and things, to make sure that the community board announces those things. What I would say is that if I sit on the board of the not-for-profit, not receiving any pay, because normally you don't as a board member, if I'm also the community board member, I would not be the person who's putting that announcement through the hopper of how the community board announces those things. I think some other person from the 501c3 who's maybe not a board member or not a community board member um, is the person who contacts the community board. Maybe the district manager is the one who's like, oh yeah, we can announce your thing. It goes into the whatever. I just don't think I as the board member of the not-for-profit because I'm associated with the not-for-profit should then take a community board action to promote the not-for-profit. That's the answer there. Great, thank you. Um, we had another question. If you sit on the board of a nonprofit, but the matter before the community board, quote, does not address, end quote, financial interest, is the community board member prohibited from voting on the matter? Yeah, that's a great question. And the answer is you're not going to like this as it depends, right? So if we think about financial interest in a very sort of broad way where it could also be like zoning variants or things like that, well, then the answer is no, you can't, you can't do that. But if we think of like, as I mentioned in the transportation alternatives, if if it's like, well, my not-for-profit really thinks that, you know, uh, affordable housing is a great idea, so they love that you guys are going to vote this way. It's not a program that's going to benefit our not-for-profit in any way directly. Then, of course, you're going to be able to vote on it because there's no real um, tangible benefit coming back to the not-for-profit with which you are associated. So it's gonna depend, but I would say we wanna be careful. It's not just things that the not-for-profit likes. It's gotta be something coming back to the not-for-profit, either direct financial benefit or mitigation of loss. Got it. Um, another question, if a developer wants to build a sky skyscraper next door, am I precluded from voting on its application even though there's no direct financial relationship? Okay, excellent question. So. A uh, developer wants to build a skyscraper right next to my house. And now the question that we want to answer is, um, obviously, I think this is going to be, let's say for me, I think this is terrible. It's going to ruin the, the 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 feel of the neighborhood because it's too many floors given the neighborhood of what we are. This is a very Brooklyn problem, I think, right now. Um, and so uh, the answer to that question is, I think, uh, I, I want to be a little careful here. I, um, I think that, that th this kind of hypothetical, if this has actually happened, I want somebody to call for advice. And here's why. Because there's some advice that's been kind of examined in a public way, in a public context, that suggests that if the effect, 
is broad enough, like the is affecting like a really broad class of homeowners, and it's not really uh, directed solely at me, then I am not precluded from voting on the thing. Now, you know, skyscrapers got a big footprint. There's probably lots of property owners who feel similarly to me, like we don't want it here because it's ruining the feel of the neighborhood. So that's what it sounds like to me is I'm not sure that I have to use the three Ds, but the closer that we get to the skyscraper really only affecting my property interests or only a few properties interests, the closer we get to a 3D thing. So here, probably got to know a few more facts before I can give you a definite, and that's why I think it's a good candidate for a legal advice call if this is actually happening. Great. I think this other question is a little super specific, but they wanted to know about kind of like uh, indirect clients in a sense. So they use the example of Amazon being a client of theirs, on the technological side, but then since Amazon has a relationship with Whole Foods, would I need to exclude myself from anything related to Whole Foods? Like, uh, That is a great question. So here we're worried that like, and I should know this, I don't know this though, like what's the, what's the relationship between Amazon and Whole Foods? Like how much ownership and that kind of stuff? Um, um, I, I never, I always want to err on the side of caution. Um, um, you know, the Whole Foods, Amazon, I'm going to give you a really hyper-technical answer. I, I think that there's probably people in uh, New York City who don't know that what the relationship is between Whole Foods and Amazon, or even if there is one, right? Um, um, and that, uh, although, you know, you got to get that discount on the Prime app. So I guess, I, anyway, I don't know. So the answer to this is, um, I don't know because I don't know the ownership structure. Uh, the person I think who's got the question should write in for legal advice and we got to give you an answer. And and it may be like, I'm just the dumb one here and this is an easy question, but I don't want to give you like, hey, it's no problem. And then somebody ends up in a problem. So I think we'd call for legal advice on that one. Um, I'll go through last couple fairly quickly. I yeah. think when you were talking about a uh, scenario with bike lanes and transportation alternatives, um, somebody had asked, um, what if the proposed bike lane is in an area where I live? Can I still vote? Okay. Now that I feel in more confident ground saying that because the bike lane is not directed directly at me, I'm not the sole beneficiary of the bike lane, but it's actually directed at, I mean, not even just the property owners really in the area, but you know, it's like all of city of New York may be using that, you know, cause they're riding down the bike lane, going different places. I don't think that there's an issue there. I, I think, you know, you could, could we tweak it a little bit and say like the bike lane is somehow going to cause some sort of, my, my driveway easement to go away and now I've got a direct interest in this, maybe, right? But that's not what was been put forth. So uh, I think because bike lane is not direct enough to my interests, I wouldn't put it in the basket of um, uh, disclose, discuss, don't vote. Uh, just a couple more. Um, actually, I'll go to this last one here. Um, with the example of a DOE employee sitting on a committee but not chairing, um, would they need yeah. to recuse themselves from votes or resolutions that call on the DOE to just do something right? So not necessarily like a financial, but just like a reso in support of or against a certain action? Uh, yeah, the safe answer here is uh, I think it's any any kind of resolution where the communication is is demanding something of DOE, even when it's something like just do something. I think if you're the DOE employee, I think you, you've got to use the disclose, discuss, don't vote. If you want a different answer, you could call, push back on legal advice tomorrow and say, hey, I think that training guy is crazy. Maybe, maybe does that really mean that? Maybe they'll give you a different answer. But my 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 conservative reading is don't do that. Great. Thank you, Alex. Um, I think I'll leave it there just because I want to be very mindful of folks' time. I know some folks have meetings coming up. Uh, community board work is never done. Um, but just want to thank you, Alex. Um, some folks were asking for the slide deck if you share that out with us. Um, um, yeah, I can, I can, um, you know what I should do actually is I've got a like three page handout kind of bulleted that summarizes everything much more succinctly and clearly than my silly PowerPoint deck, which is sort of held together with cardboard and duct tape, uh, uh, and it's really a visual aid for me. So I'll, I'll send that to you all, the Manhattan Borough President's office, and then you can send it out. Okay. Great. Thank you so much. Uh, Thanks everyone for being here. We appreciate you taking your time out to take the training. Um, if there was something that 
you wanted to go over again, these trainings are all recorded. And at the end of our leadership training week, we will have them all on our website. So just want to say thank you again and hope everyone has a good night. And again, just plugging, we have some more trainings coming up, including next Tuesday uh, evening for our housing finance. So please sign up if you have availability. Thank you, Alex. Thanks, everybody. Take care. Thank you. Good night. Have a nice night, everyone.